up. And if you make, if you can share it to the screen, um, share what to the screen with oh, your presentation. Yeah. Hit share uh, screen. Uh, so before we start, or was it the formal presentations? We the theme we had today was crowdfunding. So all three of the uh, startups here today are doing a crowdfund raise, and they happen to all be on WeFunder, but there are many forms of crowdfunding nowadays. Um, so if anyone has any questions on that, feel free to you know, ask me or bring it up um, throughout the presentation. But a quick blurb on that, what kind of makes what they're doing on WeFunder, I guess, different or unique that is not traditional, would be uh, there are past in the past like five to 10 years where people can raise money from non-accredited investors. So you don't have to be rich to invest money into in companies anymore. They use the, the mechanism of a crowdfund to get a whole bunch of little checks together for somebody. But what is different than like a Kickstarter campaign where you're kind of just donating money or buying a future product is on platforms like WeFunder, you can actually own equity in a company, create like a loan for a company, right? Or actually do like a revenue share on a company. So again, if you're in the area of like looking for alternative ways to invest or interested in just, if you're doing a round, you want to bring the crowd in or, or your loyal customers or, you know, your supporters to own a piece of equity in your company, that's like a newer mechanism. And then more recently in the laws, there was a cap about a million before you had to flip into kind of like a different vehicle. They just raised that to five million. So startups can now raise five million dollars like from the crowd, um, which is, again could be game changing right, for some startups. So, so with we, that, we do have one tech issue. Okay. Google security requires me to restart the tabs to share the screen. Okay. So, which then means probably the broadcast would stop. Yeah, I don't know. That's Otherwise, fine. it just doesn't. It just isn't going to record the screen share. Then, but what what we can do is it's going to record the camera, and I, it's on the TV somewhat, I guess. I don't know. All right, we'll do that. All Keep right, going. as long as your beautiful face is on there, most of these slides of content you can find. Y'all can see that pages. though, right? Yeah. Okay. How much time is it? All right. Yes. Where's the uh? Uh, all right. I mean, that's good enough, right? I don't know how to full screen that. That is full screen. All right. Anyway, hi, guys. Welcome to the Gaming Lounge. Thanks for coming. We're Great Lakes Gaming. Uh, not only do we have this beautiful facility, but we also host esports uh, tournaments and broadcasts uh, for our virtual community online across the U.S. and Canada. So to get started, our first problem is the broadcasting side of things. Uh, we found that a lot of the technology used for uh, sports broadcasting, including esports, is very outdated. Requires a lot of complicated technology that's very expensive, both hardware and software, and it's very inaccessible for the average user, especially in esports when it's a growing market. Uh, usually, a producer, your observer, etc., that are just people straight out of college and they're looking to get into it, but there's no way they can afford something like the NFL like that. So that's where we're going to come in and help. The other problem is uh, the underserved community here in esports. It's targeted mostly towards Younger groups, 16 younger, there's not a lot of focus on the prof young professionals. So we're trying to offer something that's a little bit more serious. And there's a lot of lacking infrastructure. So that's where we're providing that platform for. And also it's a very expensive uh, lifestyle to be a part of eSports. And that's where we help with the gaming launch being a way to, to have a cheaper alternative. So for the software, we're able to do things that are a lot more powerful than what you even see on the NFL type of broadcast. We could do it on one computer, even half of a monitor, and it uses like one one hundredth of your computer power. So that's what we're doing for our online broadcasting. And the cool thing is it doesn't even have to be just video games. We can do it for anything broadcasting related. Uh, our community, we have thousands of monthly new and recurring players. Uh, I think last month we had 2,000 players. And then um, in total, from April to December, we had 28,000 unique players in our tournaments and broadcasts. Um, we have our unique way of advertising, so sponsors and advertisers that want to pay us to use our platform or be a part of us. That's where they pay us to be, uh, where we can integrate their ads into our broadcasting technology. We even go as far as 3D modeling characters and scenes to integrate their, uh, their own unique uh, products into it. And then the GLG brand is pretty strong. We've been fully established for two and a half years. Uh, we started in January 2020, so we really nailed that one. 
Um, and we have a really, really, uh, yeah. um, we have a really large community that's been really trusting and helping us grow to where we're at today. Uh, the lounge, well, you're in it, so you know you've seen it. I don't know if you visited the gaming room, but that's where people can come up, pay to play, either by the hour or as a, a membership. So we charge $100 a month or $1,000 for the year. We get unlimited hours, get guest passes, so just like a country club. And the way that we uh, incentivize people to pay that much money is that it's a lot cheaper. So we have a $2,500 computer, but instead you can get a membership here for 1000 bucks, and then you're part of a community as well. Uh, so the Country Club of Gaming, as you can tell, it's very high-end. It's very nice-looking. Thank you, Evan Galena, for helping us build out this place. Uh, and then, again, we're uh, that professional experience. You don't see a lot of that in gaming. It's a lot of dark, grungy basement or strip mall kind of stuff, and that's where we're uh, approaching it differently, uh, as well as premium pricing. If we're a lot more of a classy experience, you got to pay for it. And so this is just an example of a dinner we hosted the other day. Uh, here are some of our customers. Uh, some names that you might notice are MSI, HyperX, and Greenlight, as well as RIT, who thank you, Soyce, for sponsoring the food today. Uh, here's some financial data. Uh, in 2022, we uh, had a revenue of 89500 That's up 3.7 times since last year, and we're hoping to do that again this year with four times. And you can see the breakdown is this is pretty much what was to be expected in terms of sponsorship. Uh, I was not expecting the events and service sales. That's something that we learned this year was uh, something that we're going to explore a lot more is the private individual booking of events and using our launch space for that. Um, for our market size, we're focused on that small group, that, that little pink line there, if you can see that. Um, that's our competitive players, the ones that are more serious, more dedicated to the gaming market. And typically what you see in the gaming industry, people spend about $1,200 per year on their uh, gaming hobbies. That's buying equipment, buying the video games, et cetera. So for the team, there's me, the founder, Justin, our talented lead developer from RIT. And then we have Leo back there as our general manager of the launch, helping make sure today ran well. Would not have happened without him. And then shout out to our advisory board. Uh, thank Rob and Michael. Uh, where, where's Rob? There you are. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, the good news is about, not that good news. The good thing about our advisory board is they're all very diverse in their backgrounds of where they got involved in startups, businesses, et cetera. And that's really helped me uh, learn and grow because I have no idea what I'm doing half the time. So it's nice to rely on someone like that. Um, and then tournament data. Again, you can see this is a 10 week period of a sponsorship that we got. And you could, uh, we really outperformed the expectations of our sponsors. Uh, and what we're trying to raise through our crowdsourcing, what uh, Michael was talking earlier, uh, we're just starting our WeFunder campaign. Our goal is to start very small and go for 125000 This will help us with hiring our sales team and marketing team and hopefully then growing our revenue. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate you guys coming to the Gaming Lounge for the, tonight's pitch battle. Uh, we stream to Twitch. So what we do, our broadcasting stuff is the overlays that you see. It's a way to manage all the overlays, the animation, animations, the videos, and all that stuff. So like the person who's playing the game, right, your stuff? And then on top of their game. On top of that. Yeah. So like in the NFL, you have like, you know, them playing football out there, but without the scores, without the team names and stuff like that, you'd have no idea what's going on. It's not the players, it's the viewers it's that the, see their stuff. Yeah. Right, right, right. So the, Yep, yep. So exactly. So you're watching Twitch, you see their stuff out on the broadcast, and the player doesn't feel like it's right? But the viewer at home sees it. So that's why I tell people on the page. So then are you the in between between the advertiser and the player? E -E. Not necessarily the player, because the player could have their own stream and do their own thing. Uh, the advertise so we organize the events, or people hire us to broadcast for their events, and that's where they want to get their advertisements on that broadcast. So they sponsor us for our own internal events, uh, but then our other part to the broadcasting is people hire us to operate their broadcast for them, and then. So the player would like come to the event. Yeah. Play in the event. Yeah. So it's like a tournament. 
That's exactly what we did. We did 100 tournaments this year. Uh, one in the back, and then we'll do Jay. I know that the Nerdvada is just open. Are you yeah. guys like similar or different? Uh, similar that we're in like gaming space, but different because they're like a restaurant kind of experience first. Um, I don't, have you been in there yet? Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's booth seating and whatever, and you go there, you eat, and then you drink, and then you can play your games at your booth. We're here more for the gaming first, and then we just had snacks and treats and stuff like that on the side. Yep. So could you tell us about your funding? Journey and what brought you to this oh, it's, it's been a ride. Uh, we haven't done no private rounds of investment. It's been just uh, uh, self-started bootstrapped, a grant from RIT that really got it started, and then a gift from the grandparents. So thank you, Grandma and Grandpa. Um, and then a SBL, SBA loan uh, was the most recent. Why not? Why do you oh. this way? Uh, because we're such a community oriented business first, uh, it just makes sense to go that way, especially after having dozens of conversations about VCs funding and going that route, we're not very appealing as a VC route, uh, at this moment because the whole broadcasting scene is weird, but, uh, we're focused on the community aspect because we have the 2000 players a month, let's say, uh, large social following, et cetera. Um, and one other question, um, Trends in the industry, what's going on? I mean, we were Everything is crashing and burning. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're seeing a lot of people get either acquired or constricted or go out of business or whatever or pivot. And the way we're pivoting is more towards that broadcasting side of things. Oh, okay. Um, it's, yeah. It's very much like the typical sales route where you got to call and email and whatever and figure out a deal and it takes forever to get. But basically, they'll get uh, they'll give us money. Uh, so one of our most recent ones was like twelve hundred fifty dollars a week to host a tournament on this platform. So we switched our tournaments from one platform to their platform. They paid us that money. We brought the players and the um, the viewership to their platform. Uh, another one is like HyperX. They sponsored all of our peripherals here in the lounge. So that cut back on a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment we'd have to buy. Yep. Yeah. Any, any sponsors? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, oh, we also. Uh, oh, I forgot about that. I'm not going to lie. If you guys want to participate in the lounge, we're just doing 10 bucks for the rest of the night, however long you want to stay here. Cutting it off at midnight, actually. I don't want to stay here until 2. I know some of you guys might want to. Uh, but, yeah. Oh, the Twitter is GL Gaming Lounges. Uh, same with Instagram and TikTok. Um, yes, please get rid of that, right? I don't think any of us want to take that back. Oh, so I gotta navigate this and find my own. Hopefully, your tab is open. This one. All right, now slideshow. Hopefully all my animations still work because they were done in PowerPoint. <laughs> There's like animations on every slide. Right. You know what? This will be fun. We got to make sure that everything's It's okay. Yeah. All right, how's it going, everyone? So uh, I want to start out and say this can be a little bit of a non-traditional pitch. We've got a couple confessions. One is Zach, our CEO, usually does the pitches. Uh, secondly, we were up late last night finishing a NASA proposal and submitting it. So I'm really just reusing a pitch I did for something else earlier this year. But we're going to have fun with it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are Circle Optics. Uh, we develop panoramic cameras for defense, aerospace, and robotics use cases. I'm not going to go too much into a traditional pitch because I think most people here in this room have heard about those sorts of things. But before I get started, I want to give a shout out to those who have supported us along the way. 
um, from the Tech Garden Syracuse, Genius New York, uh, RT Venture Creations Incubator, Launch New York, Nextcore, Luminate, so many others in the community. I don't have them all listed here. Um, so something most people in this room probably don't know about us, uh, Circle, although we've been in Rochester for a while, this is not where we got our start. Uh, we actually started in a small little town, some of you might have heard of, uh, called New York City. Um, this actually here was the building that we were in when we were in New York City. Great, great rents too. Um, <laughs> but then we moved over here to this beautiful building, Sibley and Nextcore. Um, you know, we think it was a really great move to move up from New York to uh, Rochester to grow the company. Um, a lot of people often ask and think that this was because of the optics ecosystem in Rochester, New York. And that certainly played an important part. But I think larger than that is we were a hungry company and we were looking for a community that was willing to support us and help us as we grow. And I think that's what we found in Rochester. Uh, in Rochester, you know, we found great institutions with fantastic talent. Um, there's the legacy of the big three and, the you know, talent and the science and the tech that came from them. Uh, there's fantastic office spaces like the one here. Um, we had developed a really great company culture as part of that. And we have grown. Uh, starting from just the two of us, me and Zach, uh, growing to this team here and continued growing. And here's the latest photo of our team. Uh, we're now currently 16 uh, full-time employees, uh, plus a handful of consultants, interns, and the such. Um, you know, uh, recently, uh, most recently, we we're also uh, announced is um, one of this year's most fundable companies, uh, Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies Challenge. I believe there's over 2,000 companies, 4,000 companies applied this year, and we're one of uh, less than two dozen who were selected. So we got to fly out to uh, Malibu and accept this award there, which was really fantastic. Um, this was a really great experience. It was a really intense due diligence process, uh, but they looked at all the companies who applied and they decided that we had what it take to be one of the most fundable companies this year. Um, you know, outside of just us though, um, I think that what I was saying about Rochester, that there's a lot of others that have been noticed that as well. Um, recently within the past few years, there was a, I have my animations are not all working. Um, there was a, a book that came out called Jumpstart in America, where, Jumpstart in America, where um, Jonathan Gruber and Simon Johnson looked at, uh, I believe it was around 500 metropolitan areas inside the United States that had the potential to be the next Silicon Valley. So they weren't looking at things like Austin, New York City, Boston, areas that already made. They're looking at these smaller um, cities that had a lot of potential. And uh, on the top 16, there was five upstate New York cities and regions which I think is just amazing. And number one on their list was actually Rochester, New York. So again, I think that goes back to the legacy of the big three, this building that we're in right now, formerly Xerox, um, almost all of our team uh, at one point in time worked at Kodak, Xerox, Bao Shalom. My dad was a Kodaker, right? It's, it's built into our team. But, um, you know, I think that's enough of me waxing poetic about how great of an ecosystem this is for a startup. So uh, we've got this little video here that I'm going to play, and this is going to do a little bit more of the traditional pitch and let everyone know a little bit about the fundraising campaign that we're doing. Oh, I am not playing this video here. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's now just an image when it got uploaded. Jen, is this public on YouTube? It is. Or is it private on YouTube? Uh, we're we're yeah, going to pull. Yeah. Okay. See how adaptable the founders are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about this that's streaming right now. Yeah. Well, post, post production editing. Yeah. We'll hire the broadcast team over here. Oh, cool. And there'll be some overlays on top of it. Yeah. All right. Here we go.
Yeah, and uh, that campaign uh, officially kicked off two days ago, um, raising 500,000. Um, I think we've got around 200,000 in commitments right now with about 90,000 as of this yeah. morning. There's about 90,000 has actually been invested. So uh, I don't need the full time. I'm happy to take questions. Wow, is that good? Yeah, so uh, we really have a technology breakthrough. It's not a singular product. Uh, it's a new way of doing things when it comes to wide field of view optics that is applicable in many products and many markets. So our first system, uh, the Hydra system, was designed for the VR capture market. But since then, and really because of the pandemic, a lot of our customers that we were working with uh, had their budgets dry up, uh, we pivoted into defense and aerospace. Um, so really, since late 2020, we've been working on R&D and engineering of new systems to be adapted for the use cases of like NASA and the Air Force. Um, we're hoping to get some sales of those systems next year, but we're also looking for funding to push those innovations that we've been working on there into the commercial market. Um, what was mentioned there in the video is an, uh, a system that we originally started with NASA. It's a small, well, it's a... Um, camera system for small uh, aircraft to help them to avoid collisions, to make them a little bit more autonomous. We're trying to shrink that down so that we can put it on drones, which will allow the drones to operate beyond visual line of sight, something that you are not allowed to do today with a drone. If you fly a drone further than you can see it and it disappears, you're suddenly not in compliance with the FAA and you could get in trouble and lose your pilot's license. If you fly it around a building and you lose sight of it, you're suddenly not in compliance with the FAA and you can lose your pilot's license. The reason you can't do this today is because drones don't have enough awareness of what is happening around them, so they can't avoid collisions without the pilot directing them to avoid a collision. There was a drone owned by Google in Australia recently that was flying beyond line of sight and had an accident crashing into a, a power line and a, a transformer and knocked out power to like 2,500 people. That's the type of thing that can happen when you don't have the appropriate sensors on your drone. So that's what we're trying to build, those sensors. So wait, was that the full 15 or just the original 10? I thought it was 10 plus five for questions. Is that what it said? Okay. <laughs> Oh, someone over here, sure. Yeah. 
not FAA approved. You have to still get a waiver and less than 1% of those waivers get approved. Secondly, they're using a camera on a gimbal. It takes time to pivot that camera around. So if you need to suddenly see what's happening to your left or your right, you have to wait for the camera to pivot. And that's why they can't get the FAA approvals. They need to see a very wide field of regard and they need to be able to see it in real time with high resolution. That's what our technology does. I saw some over here first. There's so many. I'm sorry. We're going to go over here. <laughs> We've we've raised over two million in investment. That's where our initial funding came from. That includes two accelerators: the Luminate Accelerator, which we were one of the winners of in 2019, and the Genius New York Accelerator at Syracuse New York, so the world's largest uncrewed systems accelerator, which we were one of the winners of in 2021. Um, in addition to that, we've received about 3.9 million in SBIR and STTR funding. It's the money that we're asking for to have. <laughs> We've actually already received a million towards building this next generation product. Uh, that was through an NSF phase two award. What we're looking for here is there's matching funds of an additional 500,000 that you can get through an NSF phase two award. Uh, you have to raise a million dollars to get that 500,000. To date, we've already raised 850,000 towards that goal. So we're only 150,000 short, which is why we launched a weed funder. Yeah, so in the future, uh, we plan to move to sales of systems. Right now, we're primarily funded through these contracts that we're doing, uh, which are essentially NRE, non-recurring engineering contracts. Yeah, so uh, what makes us unique is our patented technology. Um, everyone else, and there's approximately four dozen different companies that we've identified doing wide field of view camera systems. They use one of two models. You either use a fisheye lens, which is you know very wide field of view, but you're putting it onto a singular sensor, so you're resolution limited, and you have what's literally called fisheye distortion, right? Not good for very high-end use cases. Or you use a multi-camera system, which again is using circular fields of view, which overlap. And the problem with those multi-camera systems is where the overlap happens, you get a different type of distortion, where you can get a lot of double imagery. Uh, think about this like Google Street View, when you see those houses that are misaligned, you know that Google Street View takes approximately six months to get new stuff up online because of all the processing they have to do. And they don't have a smooth 60 frame per second drive down any street that they go down. They do one photo every couple blocks because of the amount of processing it takes to fix that. What our system does is it collects better images in the optics, which do not overlap and do not have either of those types of distortions so that we can live stream in real time the imagery that we're capturing. And it's not just me saying that. We have... Right now, to date, three patents awarded, nine patents pending. We've been verified by NASA. We've been verified by the U.S. Air Force. The founder of Google Street View, Luke Vinson, has invested in our company. Now, he's not with Google Street View anymore. He's with Meta, so we don't have that immediate in. But those are all the forms of validation that we have of our method of combining these fields of view. So that's, actually that's what it is, yeah. No parallax in the camera. Now, everyone knows that. So Good, good job. Okay. So the video is like a continuous, like if you're looking around like this, and you can see. Yeah. Have so. You, have you ever looked at like the real estate or storage street? Because like right now, you can gather some more, but if you're a camera that takes a picture, mm -hmm. it's just got it pretty expensive for builders to use that if they want to use. And yeah. More of a minute on the market now, especially if people move across the country, they want home tours of the housing units. They just can't get their time to put it on. We have looked at that as one of the industries. Uh, the reason we're not trying to immediately tackle that one um, is hardware, especially optical hardware and low scales is expensive. So it's not quite at the price point that industry needs yet. We want to tackle these ones that, um, you know, aerospace and defense saving lives. They're willing to pay a lot of money for systems that we're building in essentially one offs. Um, as we scale and classicize and reduce size, um, that opens up. That market there for real estate, it opens up robotics markets, it opens up self-driving car markets. There's a whole bunch of different markets that we plan to go into in the future. So like Tesla, they made like $100,000 Tesla on the truck serving in California. Yes. Now they'll just pocket the difference. <laughs> just keep charging $100,000. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. After this, we have a speed pitch, and also, not to put
putting it on the spot, but food sector guys want to also kind of give a, a kind of quick what they're looking for with their you have flyers here yeah. after the pitch. Yeah. 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 So before everyone gets up and grabs more drinks, we'll have two more quick tidbits for you guys. Is that okay with you? Otherwise, I'll cover it myself. I'll, I'll channel my inner food sector. You're all set here? I am good. All right. So ours is a bit non traditional compared to the other two, as we are a sports team and not a product itself. Um, but I'm with Flower City Union, the newest professional soccer team in Rochester. Um, I'm going to start off with a video and let that do something. So the video obviously explained a bit there of our difference to other sports organizations where, hopefully I did not get rid of our slide here. May have had to go back on the video.
just pop it open again. Yeah, reopen. What about their history? Oh, wait, right, there we are. Look at that. All right. So, again, uh, the difference is obviously, like um, she said there, with having minimum net worth for owning a team where we are, we have majority ownership, but we also have our weave under campaign so people can own a share of the team and not have all of those restrictions. Um, I guess while it's up here on the opening slide, I'll get to Salt City Union, which is a recent announcement as of a week or two ago, where we absorbed another team from Syracuse that was part of our league last year. And we absorbed them and rebranded them as Salt City Union. And our plan for next season is to not only be a team in Rochester, but we will also play games in Syracuse and have that co-branded team, which is another thing that has never been seen before in soccer with having... It's been in other sports with like the Washington Bullets and the Baltimore Bullets, where they played in Washington, D.C., but also in Baltimore. Um, but it's never done in soccer. So this will be a experiment of a year for that. Um, I won't go through our whole mission statement, but the main point that people like to hear from our mission statement is that we are a flower city business operating sport as opposed to a sports team operating in Rochester. So with the Western New York Flash, obviously they were a big part of this community for a while, and then they sold, moved to North Carolina. That wouldn't be, that isn't a thing with us um, because we focus more on Rochester and bettering the community as opposed to just feeding off of it for as much as we can. So we play in NISA, is the league that we play in. Um, it's also a fairly new league. It started up during COVID and has been growing from there. And it's the National Independent Soccer Association, which is division three in professional soccer. So you have <coughs> division one, which is major league soccer, division two, which is USL championship, which is what the Rhinos used to play in. And then you have division three, which has NISA, MLS Next Pro, which is what RNYFC plays in, and then you have USL League One. So with that, of us wanting to better the Rochester community just as much as we participate in sports, is we do a lot within the community. So last year we participated in the Galasano Strong Walk, uh, the NAMI Walk. With everything going on in Ukraine, we partnered with Rock Madon and did a lot with them in terms of raising for that charity. Um, veterans Outreach, we do a lot with them as well. And then the city of Rochester, we have a great relationship with them, which is why we're allowed to use that soccer specific stadium downtown that wasn't used for quite a few years. And we do also programs for the inner city schools, as well as this year, something that's not very common, we'll be having a matinee game on a weekday. So all the schools can do a field trip to a professional soccer match. And then we are also, we just uh, launched our soccer foundation, which is going to be a charitable arm of the team that's going to kind of take over a lot of the charity work that we do. And it's also going to be, it's going to give us an opportunity to give 501c3s to people that invest in the team for the charitable purpose rather than the soccer related purpose. So it will give them write offs for whatever they donate to the team whether it be donate so we can donate tickets to the urban league donate tickets to all these foundations or however they want to contribute to that and then i touched on the salt city flower city union um soccer itself over the years a lot with cte and concussions in football it's been phasing out of especially high school sports everything else and soccer is taking over which it's always been popular in youth, but it's always obviously been a lot more popular outside of the U.S., where we're finally getting that growth in the U.S. So as of 2019, 52% more adults consider themselves a soccer fan compared to 2012, which has the largest growth by far. Uh, ice hockey is very close 
as we've seen with the Amherst success last year selling out playoff games. Um, I'm getting a, a wave, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, and then also, soccer in the mainstream, you have Ted Lasso and Welcome to Wrexham in the past two years just blowing up and taking over uh, Ted Lasso, obviously, seven Emmy Awards, and Apple TV took that, ran with it, and now Apple TV owns the rights for MLS for the season. And then Welcome to Wrexham, where Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, two very large stars in the U.S., bought a team in Wales and are trying that journey over there. And the World Cup, every four years, it just boosts the excitement, especially when the U.S. can do well. The nice thing is in 2026, it's coming to North America. And it's the first time that's ever going to be hosted in multiple cities at once. So we'll have not only games in the U.S., but also Mexico and Canada. And especially like 1994 is the most lucrative World Cup in FIFA history. So we're hoping in 2026, it's just going to do that. And over the next four years, as we grow as a team, we're hoping there's just a big boost there and we can capitalize on that. You can drink beers then. Yes, yes we can. <laughs> um, all right, perfect. Yes. Is there a limited number of potential shareholders? No. It's not capped. Um, obviously, as more come on, the structure has to be different as we do have two majority owners that are the main ownership group. Our WeFunder, funder, it's a, small, it's a small portion, but it's still there, obviously, so we can offer that opportunity to own and invest in a pro club other than, say, the Packers, where they release shares, but you don't actually get ownership of the team. It's just kind of a piece of paper to frame and put on your wall. She, we were in talks with her early on. Um, she just isn't as connected to Rochester anymore. Um, her brother actually works for Leaf Filter and he's been involved with the team a little bit because um, he's still local to Rochester, but Abby just not being here just isn't as involved with this market. So last year was our first season. Um, this year, obviously our second season. And at this point, we don't even have our schedule released yet. And we've already seen a 100% growth in season ticket revenue before the season, um, season ticket holders as well. And the nice thing about the downtown stadium is we have 14 suites available, which usually are sold on a pregame basis. Usually companies will do employee events there, customer appreciation events there. Um, and we already have two of those sold for full seasons, um, which is huge for us. So we're hoping, obviously we're not going to 100% every year, but we're really hoping to get at least to the end of the Rhinos tenure, uh, how well they were doing with that stadium, is just get to, last year our average attendance by the end of the year, between, well, we started our season in March and it went to October. So our early season games, there was excitement, but the weather is not there. And then we hosted DC United. So we had an MLS team here in April and it was 32 degrees with sideways rain slash snow. So what should have been a huge game, huge opportunity, it was our best game of the year, of course, but that was mainly sweets because people were just trying to stay inside. So what we're really hoping, I think at the end of the Rhinos, they were averaging 3000 in attendance. And our end of the year last year was around the 900 to 1100 range. So we're hoping if in the next four years we can get up to that point, that would be great for us. Ticket sales, merchandise, sponsorships. That's yeah, yep. We do clinics. Uh, we host since we're a bottom. Uh, division still professional, but we're down there. We host a lot of open tryouts as well, which we've done. Um, but yes, we do a lot of clinics. We actually just uh, 
are getting a partnership going with the Little Kickers program at Tri County Sports Complex. Um, and then we also do stuff at Rock Sports Garden and kind of all those indoor facilities, especially this time of year when we can't really use the field. A lot of former college players, other players that have already been in the professional system, at this level, it's a lot of one-year contracts because your hope is to go up to the next level. So you're not signing 10-year contracts like you are in other major sports. So it's a lot of just that, and then obviously new players entering. That's more on the technical side, so I can't speak too much to that. But um, we also like to keep Rochester players. I think we had seven players from Rochester last season. So we like to keep it in the community as much as we can. Is that my time? Thank Perfect. You. Yeah. All right. We had, before we go back to unleashing you guys on the games and the drinks, we had a founder here, Lisa. We're going to let her do a quick pitch and then, yeah. Oh, we're excited. We're on out. <laughs> I don't know if everyone can see it. Um, so yeah, my company is um, Best Friends Network, which is a mobile application. Um, so the problem essentially starts from like the increasing anxiety in teens due to a multitude of factors, such as the toxicity on social media apps, like Instagram, TikTok, and um, the last one, Be Real. Uh, so therefore, like my app works to like help teens on. And the fly, can you pair it to the screen? Yes. Then this will like find the screen, yeah, right? Sorry, you were so good at jumping up here and so brave. At least you didn't try to, you know, bring a PowerPoint presentation to a Mac and. Yeah. <laughs> Hope, <laughs> hope animations will work. I think I need the Wi Fi password. How, how many people have been ever in their lives to a soccer game in Rochester? I went to the at UC United game. You guys came close to Rochester. And a couple of suites for the staff team and whatever, and it was a very fun team building opportunity. Uh, very affordable, great time all around, and unlimited beer, so that helped getting people. Beer in the suites. Yeah, That's yeah. Do, do you, can you fit all these people in one suite? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why it's not connected. Oh, there you go. All right. And then you set up uh, displays. Oh, or that. Uh, and then. It's a T55. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, wrong one. No, not that one. I should figure out how to name these. You just ruined your flow. Oh, I can do it. Sorry. All right, there we go. Uh, eight. Five through six. Either, you're not writing anything. Oh, wow. Those are the last four digits of my phone are not in the same order. I was going to say it would be trippy if it was. All right, you're all connected. Sweet. 